September 13th, 1814. The War of 1812 is not going well for the American forces. At the end of August, just days earlier, the British had overtaken Washington, D.C., burning it to the ground and forcing the government to flee the capital. The string of British triumphs has brought the United States to the verge of disaster. After Washington, the English set their sights to the north. They'll regroup the British Navy, Navy Army working together and they'll look at their maps and decide that Baltimore is the next worthy target. All that stood between England and ultimate victory in the War of 1812 were the defenders of Fort McHenry. Sitting at the mouth of Baltimore Harbor and defiantly flying an oversized American flag, the fort was the final bastion between American morale and total defeat. As a British fleet of almost 20 ships converged on the fort, a young American lawyer named Francis Scott Key found himself swept up in the conflict. From out in the harbor, he watched helpless as the fleet unleashed a deadly 25-hour bombardment on the fort. As the attack started, Key saw the flag over Fort McHenry and knew the fort was still in American hands. But as darkness fell and the smoke of cannon fire covered the battlefield, Key was plunged into uncertainty, not knowing if the fort, along with hope for an American comeback, had fallen into British hands. Who was Francis Scott Key? How did he end up in Baltimore Harbor on this fateful fall evening? And how did Key's first-hand account of that battle become the most important poem in American history? Francis Scott Key was born in the woods of Northern Maryland in 1779 on his family's plantation. Born after the signing of the Declaration of Independence, he was a member of the first generation that could truly call themselves American. For them, the glory days of the American Revolution were not personal experiences, but stories told to them by their fathers. By age 10, Key was sent to Annapolis, the capital of Maryland, by his wealthy family for schooling. This was a time when school of any sort was still a luxury. There really was no official educational system. What happened was in the Constitution, it doesn't mention the federal government's power over education at all. Uh, and so it was left up to the states. Most people would have been educated at home. Uh, and most education uh, wouldn't have gone beyond kind of basic literacy. Some people were educated in universities and colleges but most of those were for training ministers. But Key's father, a wealthy and well-known judge, could easily afford the cost of tuition. And at age 17, Key enrolled at St. John's College in Annapolis. The college was originally founded as the King William School. It is the third oldest college in the United States. It was founded so that the senators could have a good place to send their kids to college, get educated. Although Key enrolled at the college to study law, his education introduced him to a wide variety of subjects. St. John's today has what they call um, a classical liberal arts model of education, which is very unique among modern day colleges, but that's the way people were educated back then. That was very standard. And um, people who were educated, whether they were educated by a private tutor or if they sent their kids to college, they would study um, basically the seven liberal arts. In these rooms at St. John's College, Key's studies included seminars on math, music, linguistics, and the natural sciences. I think that to have this broad, deep education would really create a person who's very well-rounded and well-spoken and articulate. While pursuing his studies at St. John's, Key spent a lot of time at his uncle's farm outside Annapolis. Here, he could explore the natural world unfettered. When I think back, I imagine what it would be like to be a college student um, at the King William School at that time. Um, I think, first of all, there'd be very few distractions, the kind of distractions we have today. Um, so you'd probably be more influenced by the natural world, by your own um, physical space, and then by the things that you were learning. After completing his studies, Key set up a law practice outside of Washington, D.C. But while Key was establishing himself as a lawyer, the fledgling United States was struggling to find its place in the tumultuous global panorama. We, of course, fought the revolution, everything uh, finished that. Uh, we're supposedly at peace, but things aren't going to go too well in Europe. There's war. The French Revolution will eventually lead to the rise of Napoleon. War breaks out between England and Napoleon. Tensions between the U.S. and the European powers are starting to rise. Napoleon will start his conquering of all of Europe, take the English on. We try to stay out of it, stay neutral, 
but we're dependent on trade. So we're trying to trade with both the French and the English, have trouble. Uh, we have a short war with France early on and later more prolonged troubles and so forth with England. At home, with memories of the Boston Massacre still relatively fresh, the populace is wary of a strong, government-sponsored military. There's always been a very strong mistrust of the military, Army or Navy, but especially of the Navy because an army could be seen, especially a militia army, a volunteer army, is seen as a tool of the government for defense. The Navy, its role isn't as directly related to defense of the nation. You could argue that you could have a Coast Guard, something that we could defend your coastlines. A Navy is more of a projection of the nation's power. And so it's much more a, a tool of imperialism. Politicians of the day agreed. They were convinced a strong military would lead to a collapse of states' freedoms and usher in an American monarchy. It's one of those things that the founding fathers tended to agree on was you didn't want a strong, big military. That could be a tool of tyranny. Before long, the conflict in Europe spills over into the United States. The British were stopping our ships on the high seas. They were not this, they didn't have the legal uh, authority to do this. And of course, while on our ships, they were taking sailors. They would, uh, of course, claim these men were deserters from the British Navy or they're British citizens of battle cry, sailors, uh, you know, free trade, sailors' rights led to this War of 1812. Impressment of sailors and the interference of trade it brought combined with the fact that the British were using Native Americans to block U.S. Western expansion, led to calls of war against England, a war which President James Madison declared in June of 1812. The British, busy fighting Napoleon, were slow to react with the bulk of their military, and the various state militias, which were the primary American fighting force at the time, were simply not prepared for real fighting. The war became a quagmire. For much of the war, things weren't going well for the United States. Uh, they had some victories uh, in the northern portion of the war. We'll spend most of our time fight fighting the Canadians. As we roll into 1813, the British or the Navy is going to finally arrive, blockade our entire coast. The war wasn't going especially well for the United States, but uh, the British weren't having a great deal of outstanding success either. Uh, it was a of a bogged down war for both sides. The war's poor execution did not go unnoticed, and in the merchant-dominated North, Americans loudly questioned the need for the fighting. It was an unpopular war, was particularly unpopular in the northern states. Uh, New England uh, was not happy about it because they relied on shipping, uh, did a great deal of trade with Great Britain, and they shut down that trade. Back in Washington, Francis Scott Key was one of the opponents of the war. Deeply religious, Key was opposed to war of any kind, but his patriotism superseded his personal views on the war, and in 1813, Key briefly joined a local artillery outfit. Meanwhile, the war was finally beginning to heat up. A spectacular American naval victory on the Great Lakes offered the first real success in the war, but events in Washington, D.C. were about to take a turn for the worse. As we get into uh, 1814 and activities pick up then, the, the British will send over the troops necessary to uh, first, they're, they're in the Chesapeake here, their first effort will be Washington, D.C. They'll make the decision to march on Washington, D.C., August of 1814. The actions of Dolly Madison and the British ransacking of D.C. have become the stuff of American legend. But once D.C. is taken, the British look north to Baltimore for their next target. It's a major shipbuilding uh, area, Fells Point and so forth. So one of the aims is to cripple us that way to destroy our shipbuilding, ship repair facilities here in Baltimore. The British fleet moves in on the city, setting the stage for the bombardment of Fort McHenry. But while the soldiers in Fort McHenry prepared for the battle to come, a mission of peace was taking place aboard one of the ships in the harbor. Francis Scott Key, now a well-established lawyer, is one of two Americans sent to the British fleet to negotiate the release of a prisoner, Dr. William Beans. They've arrested Dr. Beans uh, for an infraction and they, 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 they're going to hang the poor man. Key is successful in his quest and he and his band are prepared to return the shore. But the British do not allow them to disembark as the fleet unleashes a bombardment on Fort McHenry. Cut off from the shore, the only way Key can tell if the battle has been won or lost is by watching the oversized American flag flying over the fort. It's a pretty good size flag. Just think of 15 stripes. It's, it's 15 stars, 15 stripes. Each one of those stripes is two feet wide. 
So when you and I stand up next to that flag, we just barely measure up to three stripes. But there's 15 of those stripes, two feet wide. The stars are two feet point to point. So it's, it's a huge banner, very impressive. Quite, quite a sight to see when it's on the flagpole, and that was to impress the British that this is indeed Fort McHenry, and Fort McHenry's ready for a fight. As the battle wore on, smoke and the darkness of night obscured the trio's view. To alleviate his stress, Key turned to writing poetry. And he's been writing poetry all of his life. He's gained a love of poetry as a young man, uh, and has continued to write throughout his life. And he has the opportunity, 25 hours, paper, pen, and he'll start writing what becomes our Star Spangled Banner. The poem Key wrote reflects the confusion and uncertainty of the battle. Indeed, every day millions of Americans sing the Star Spangled Banner, not realizing that the first stanza of the poem ends in a question. The anthem ends with Key essentially asking if hope for an American future has been obliterated off the face of the earth. Lucky for Key, and for the United States, Fort McHenry lasted through all 1,500 shells launched at it by the British Navy. Fortunately for the defenders, it was rainy. It was raining almost the entire battle, and rain has a tendency to put out the fuses on bombs. So these bombs are coming in, but they're not necessarily exploding, causing the damage they're supposed to. Baltimore is safe. Key and his entourage are returned to shore, and within three months of the battle, a peace is negotiated between the United States and England. But even though the battle is over, Key's story is only beginning. From Baltimore, the story heads south to Maryland's capital city of Annapolis and to a piece of land that is now part of the United States Naval Academy. Here we have the uh, official marker marking the site of the uh, former house of uh, Judge Joseph uh, Hopper Nicholson in which the original manuscript of the Star Spangled Banner uh, was located until 1947 when the property was bought by the federal government to expand the U.S. Naval Academy. Francis Scott Key was a little shy about sharing his poem with anyone else, and it probably would have stayed in this house forever if it wasn't for Judge Nicholson's wife. His wife actually went out the door from the house in, in, in Baltimore and brought it to the printer uh, and had it printed as a broadside for the first time, and, which they spread through evidently the city of Baltimore. The people of Baltimore, still elated over their victory, devour the poem. People are not only reading it, they come to understand there's music to associate it with it. Once set to music, the poem's popularity took off. It became the de facto standard of the United States Navy in the 1880s for all official events. And by the mid-1900s, the first stanza of the poem became the United States National Anthem. The poem itself is a perfect reflection on the man that wrote it. Religious, patriotic, observant, eloquent, all characteristics that were developed during his childhood in the country, his education at the King William School, and cherished throughout his life. In the four short stanzas of the defense of Fort McHenry, Francis Scott Key created a seminal American poem that lets us see the battle through his eyes on a cool September morning by the dawn's early light.